Strong bodies, kind hearts, unstoppable minds. You're listening to Strong Girls Pod, where strong women share their stories to inspire strong girls. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Strong Girls Pod. As always, I'm your host, Charlie Ekstrom, and today we have a very special guest who we hold very near and dear to our hearts in the Strong Girls United family. She is a former fam mentor. She is a member of the USA shooting team on the pistol team. This is Miss Caitlin Ablin. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have a chat with you tonight. I'm so excited to share your story and really for everybody to hear the background of you, what came to be, and then to just go into your Olympic journey because you are a 2024 Olympian. You were a 2024 Olympic finalist in your first ever Olympic appearance. And for those who don't know, that's pretty impressive. So I'm very excited to just jump in together here. All right. So Caitlin, I've given a little bit of a preface for everybody, but I would love for you to go into your background and your story a little bit. So let's dive in talking about your career, spanning through why you chose your sport, what you did before, where you were at school. Let's open up the Caitlin file. Let's really dive in and talk about your journey. Okay. Okay. So much. Got it. Um, (laughs) I was born and raised in Douglasville, Georgia, a small city about an hour outside of Atlanta. I grew up loving sports. I I think I jumped from like from t-ball to dance to gymnastics all throughout elementary school. Never really found one that I loved until I discovered the BB gun team when I was about 10 years old, I think. So I started shooting BB gun through my local 4-H club. We had a club BB gun team in our county. And I found out about it through a fifth grade class, actually. We got a newsletter that day that said that there was a meeting for a 4-H BB gun team the next week. And I remember going home to my parents and showing my dad. And I was like, oh, can we go? Can, can we go shoot BB guns? And he was super excited. And so we went and I started shooting BB gun for about two years. And then I also was cheering at the time too. So I cheered uh, in middle school when I was shooting BB gun. So I would go from cheer practice to BB gun, vice versa, stuff like that. And so I was actually the worst person on the BB gun team. I was not good at all. I was always <laughs> on like the last, like the worst teams and stuff. I just was not a very good BB gun shooter at all, which is kind of funny where I am now. And so about two years into BB gun, my dad was going to start an air rifle team for a kid who was aging out of BB gun team. So like sidebar, air rifle is under the same like uh, organizing body as air pistol. And so internationally, stuff like that, rifle pistol is very similar, but I am a pistol shooter. But anyways, so back to the story. Uh, My dad was starting an air rifle team for a kid on my team and the practices conflicted with BB gun. And so I was just going to have to be around when he was doing these practices. And so a lady who was actually helping him with the air rifle team had a daughter my age who shot air pistol. And so I tried air pistol one night in the back of a CrossFit gym and fell in love with it. And so I quit the BB gun team immediately and started shooting air pistol. And yeah, the rest is history, I I guess. (laughs) The rest is history, and that history for anybody else who's missing is you went on, you won, if I'm reading this correctly, four national championships while a member of the pistol team at The Ohio State University. You then qualified for the 2024 Olympic Games in the 10-meter air pistol and the 25-meter pistol events, and you were an Olympic finalist at the 2024 Olympics. So that history kind of ended up kicking in and really, really seeing this career of you learning to just excel. So that's pretty phenomenal. (laughs) You, Yeah. Yeah. I started, um, so I actually made the junior national team back in 2016, 2017 and competed internationally since then and tried out for the Tokyo 2020 games and missed it. So I was actually the first alternate for the Tokyo 2021 games. And yeah, I started at Ohio State the year before Tokyo. So 2019, I started at Ohio State and have been competing there up until Paris, actually. So I missed out on the Tokyo Games while at Ohio State, and I made the Paris Games while at Ohio State. So it was definitely a full circle moment, a lot of great memories the last five years. 
at Ohio State with the pistol team. And so, yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. I just, I think it's a really special thing to be able to go in and not only exceed in the college scene, but also exceed in the international scene. It's in most sports, it's a pretty different world, but also just knowing that you were able to have kind of that set up from the get-go. I love that it was like you had the you had two Olympic journeys and that you really got to see kind of the dual-sided moments of both of them all while you were still competing at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> Caitlin, as you know, with Strong Girls United, our mission is empowering girls through sports, mentorship, and mental skills training. You have been a fan mentor for years with us now. You have been through the ins and outs. Like I said at the very beginning, you, we hold you very near and dear to our heart because you've been with us for a while as a mentor side. And as you know, we work to supply girls with the mental skills tools to succeed as early as possible so that then we can work to help them build their toolboxes of mental skills for the entirety of their lives. Now, for you, you've had a pretty lengthy career. It goes back to that whole start of your career in the back of that CrossFit gym at, on the air pistol side of things. But even before that, with BB gun, while you were competing in cheer and BB gun at the same time, you've had this long career to kind of be able to develop the toolbox of what mental skills go into an Olympic journey, what mental skills look into success in college. And I'd love if you could give us some examples of tools from your own toolbox that you've learned through training and competing in your sport, like what you do to stay motivated or any phrases or words that you use to keep your head in the game? Yeah. So a lot goes into shooting in general, especially pistol. It's a very precise sport, very mental. We're on our own for almost an hour and a half. And so there's a lot of positive self-talk that goes on. I think that is one of the biggest things I've learned through training and competing is that positive self-talk can change everything for you, for people around you. Just having that positive conversation with yourself in your head can do wonders, even though it sounds pretty dumb to people who aren't in sport or that don't practice it. Just changing your mindset from saying, oh my gosh, I suck to, okay, we'll do better next time. Or that's okay. It'll, it'll turn out well. I think that is one of my biggest tools that I've discovered the past couple years. That and breathing exercises, those are my go-to. I know... When I was a fan mentor, my mentee and I would start off every session with a breathing exercise. I try to find like a new one and we would just practice all these different ones. And by the end of the year, she had her favorite ones. I had my favorite ones and we could kind of just like talk about that. So that's one of my biggest things also breathing exercises, literally anything that can get yourself grounded that works for you. Everyone is different. Um, I like a physical touch one. So like what I do is like I breathe in. Um, one, two, three, four. And so I like tap my fingers as I breathe. So it like, counts seconds. So it's like breathe in one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, exhale one, two, three, four. And so that physical touch kind of grounds me as well as like focusing on my breath. Some phrases I use, one of my coaches actually told me this about two years ago, pressure is a privilege. And so I actually had it written on my hand during our Olympic trials and in Paris. So I had PIP written on my left hand so I could see it as I was loading my gun. I think in the final, they actually zoomed in on it at a little bit. I remember my mom telling me about it and was like, oh yeah, it says like PIP. And I was like, yeah, it's my, my, my saying. Um, so yeah, that and just trust the process. I think that's a really great phrase that I use that grounds myself. Just trust the process and what happens will happen. I absolutely love that. And looking at your sport specifically too, it is such a discipline oriented sport. Like there is such a hyper focus, such a high level of discipline that comes into the actual art and the practice that is your sport. I think that it's looking into those mental skills exercises and looking into that touch or it's something that can come so easy and simple it makes that discipline, it helps you into that routine, right? It w- I'm sure it would have to help into the little element of routine as you go into competition. Oh, definitely, yeah. Just being in the middle of a competition and either things are going really good or things are going really wrong, just knowing you can rely on something that you've done a thousand times in training or in matches and you know that it'll work. And it m- might not be instant, it might not just switch like that it might not switch how the competition is going score wise but it'll switch mentally and just being able to rely on something that you've tried in it's worked before is just a very a very comforting feeling especially when you're on the line and 
something's going wrong and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Just being like, okay, we've done this before. We know what to do. Let's breathe for a little bit or let's think, let's think of some positive thoughts, stuff like that. Oh, I absolutely love that. I think that it, it's funny because it's like, the whole element of pressure is a privilege, which I love. I've loved that phrase for a while as well. And I think that whole element of pressure is a privilege. It's like the exercises that you do and the work that you put in helps to alleviate some of the pressure or to acknowledge that the pressure is there, but then to use that pressure to your advantage. And again, going back to like, there's so much precision that comes into what you do. And so being able to use that pressure and then turn it into precision is, you know, it's, it's phenomenal. It's what you search for. Yeah. It's a great skill to have for sure. And I thrive off that. So yeah, I, that phrase is one of my favorites ever since my coach told me in a couple of years ago, I was like, this is my phrase now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's, it's mine. And I, I, I didn't see them zoom in, but that's actually pretty awesome that they zoomed in on your hand. I literally have done the exact same thing. And it's funny that you said that you started working on the phrases with your mentee because mm -hmm. my mentee and I, as we were working back years ago, we were working on increasing self-confidence and doing external things that can help us internally in game. And she and I started writing confidence and just working on, she was working on her confidence. And I was like, I could always work on my confidence on the court as I'm going into game time mode. And so something for me is like in volleyball, because my platform and my passing is so like very, very like in my peripheral and in my plain side of view. And I don't like having things on my hands, at, like, at least the time I didn't like having things on my hands. So she would write confidence on her wrist and I would write confidence on my ankle. And it was something that it was like, kept us connected and also kept the thing that we were working on present in mind, because if we wrote it out and made it that external factor, it helped bring it into the internal. And so I love that you were like, I write it, I wrote it on my hand so that I had it right there. I could look down and externally focus on the fact that pressure was a privilege in that moment. And so it doesn't even have to be reiterated and like forgotten and then brought up. Like you could look down and be like, yep, exactly. That's my saying. That's what I'm going in. I'm here to do my job. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I love it. Gave me goosebumps at them. Like the second you said it, that you're like, I wrote pressure as a privilege on my hand. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely made a difference. <laughs> I love it. And again, like we're looking at, you are 23 years old, if I'm, if I remember correctly, and you were yes. competing at an Olympic final at 23 years old. Like that is phenomenal. You are so young in the whole realm of sport. And it's so cool. Like you started that journey when you were what, 19 years old on your Olympic path and then ended up achieving the first step of the goal at 23. And so knowing that you've got so much to come, it's probably just so exciting and really just a lot to look forward to as you continue to train and do your thing. Definitely. Yeah. Now I want to start dial back a little bit and look into the kind of origins of like you were talking about at the beginning of the origins of why you ended up competing in air pistol and falling in love with it in that back of that CrossFit gym, like just testing it out for the first time. What about air pistol? Like what made you fall in love with the sport? I know that you'd said that you were really drawn to BB gun as you were testing out all these other sports. What kind of drew you in and made you fall in love with your sport the way that you have and have continued to pursue it through this love? I think the complexity of the sport really grabbed my attention in like the mental aspect, especially. So a lot of people in our sport say it's 90% mental, 10% physical. I don't know if that's actually the correct percentages, but basically it's a lot of mental and a little bit of physical. And so I think that really drew me to it. It was just that you can do, it's so detail oriented. You need to be focused 100% during that shot in for those 20, 30 seconds, you need to have like all your focus on the process and not just on the score, but the process in how to execute the best process you can at that moment. And you have to be able to ignore everything around you. You have to be able to ignore the past shots, the future shots, and you have to be so present. It's just so complicated and it seems very simple. Like it is simple, but difficult for us to execute because we're human and we like to overthink everything. And so I just loved the aspect of something being so simple yet so difficult to achieve. Yet we're all here trying, we're doing the same exact thing every single day, but our results are different depending on the day, depending on what we have going on, what we're thinking or how tired we are, what we ate that day. And so there's just so many external factors that go into shooting 
especially pistol. So it's one handed. So we need a lot of like shoulder strength, wrist strength, forearm strength, balance and core, obviously, of course. But for the most part, like you're using the same muscles, the same fine tuned muscles every single time you pick up the gun. And so you're working on those muscles, but you're also working on your mental muscles at the same time. And just being able to focus that long and that intense is a crazy thing to think that we do. And it seems so simple, yet it's so complicated. So that really drew me, drew me to it for sure. I love that. So simple, but so complicated. So much precision, but also so much strength required from that precision or to in order to get to the precision, you have to be like super strong and be able to hold up that arm. I like it. it. Like you said, there's so much complexity to that one. It looks simple, but then it just adds that complexity through and through. It's it's cool to think about of something that could be so simple from the outside that really, again, that human nature of overthinking, like you were saying too, just you know, makes it way harder when you've got a target to go for and you at the end of the day, there's so many external factors that can in times limit you, but also what you were talking about, like increase that pressure and then potentially increase that precision in the long run. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You, you talk about the mental focus and the stuff that requires like looking into the mental strength and that side of it. And like you said, it may not be 90% to 10% of mental to physical, but it very well could be at the same time. And looking into the mental aspect of it is can you talk about like entering the mindset of a practice versus a game day? Like what do you do mindset wise that helps to strengthen your performance when you go out onto, I actually don't know what your arena is called of competition, but when you step out onto the floor, like what does that mean? Or what is your mindset going into it? Whether, or what's the training like to get that into that mindset as well? Yeah. So our arena is called a range. It's very like simple. We just oh, call it a range. Um, yeah. Very <laughs> To remember <laughs> but yeah so it definitely differs from practice to match days so everyone has a warm-up routine in shooting at least i'm sure a lot of sports have this too but i know for shooting a big part is warming up the body and the mind and so i have a specific routine for both the body and the mind so like different stretches different holding exercises stuff like that for my body to warm that up but also different mental exercises whether that be mindfulness breathing just journaling i'm really big into like gratitude journaling i think it's just such like a positive it forces you to be positive and it changes your outlook in life and i feel like i'm saying a lot but anything like with positivity is just it's amazing what it can do for you and so in training a lot of ways to push that mental barrier to push those mental boundaries is to go for score is what we call it so when you're shooting you don't want to think about score you don't want to think about what your actual shot will be you really want to focus on the process but to push that you kind of want to be like okay i'm going to try to get so every shot, the highest you can get is a 10.9. And so when you're going for score, you might be like, okay, I want to get a 29 out of 30. So that's, you're shooting three shots and you want to get two tens and a nine. And so you have to figure out how to execute your process while also thinking about this score. So in a match, you wouldn't even put this on yourself. You wouldn't put any of this pressure. You would not put a score in your mind at all. But in practice, the way to kind of replicate that match pressure is to be like, okay, go for a 29, get a 29 right now. And be like, okay, how do I cope with that? How are, how's my breathing going right now? How can I, can I get my mind back to the present and focus on my process and what I need to do right now to get this? And so, yeah, in practice, that's a lot of the mental training is that or um, mindfulness sessions, eat, like meditation, stuff like that. And then before matches, I like listening to music. It depends on what like what genre, depending on like what my mind needs at that moment. Like, if I'm feeling sluggish, it'll be like pumped up music, like pop rock is something I go to. Or if I'm feeling too amped up, I'll go for like some slow like Christian music music or I don't really love classical but sometimes I'll play like one or two classical songs to like kind of like chill me out I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan too so I think that's my go-to whether like I don't really know what my what my mindset wants I'm just like okay Taylor Swift and then we'll figure it out from there so I think I listened to Taylor Swift before uh, my Olympic final so <laughs> oh my um, gosh I love that <laughs> yeah Olympic trials. I remember listening to her. Yeah. I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan. So yeah, I like love listening to music and just kind of 
makes me focus on something else that's not what's about to happen and yeah i do a bunch of breathing exercises just trying to like lower my heart rate as much as possible and um yeah that's pretty much it it's pretty cool i like that you kind of create that pressure for yourself in a practice setting of obviously you don't want to think about the scores that you're getting on a game day like it's not helping anybody to pressurize yourself on the scoreboard and see what you're see what you're looking for on a game day like obviously you're trying to shoot as high as best as you can but creating that opportunity to like bring competition into a practice setting I love that and I love that you're able to just really like okay I want to shoot these numbers how do I do that I'm going there I'm doing this this and this it makes a game for yourself when you're in a situation that doesn't necessarily need to be that pre- or it doesn't not that it doesn't need to be but that it doesn't have that pressure innately because you're again you're not necessarily competing for every for anything other than the standard that you set for yourself so I like that you're able to kind of create that pressure for yourself and then take it back and then do some mindfulness and really figure it out I also love that you listen to music to really take that focus away from the game before you go in and shoot at the range like I love that Taylor Swift was your Olympic trials and Olympic final because clearly like you had made it to the to the peak so might as well listen to your favorite thing and I like that you have a routine that can go in regardless of situation and that you can adjust it to where you're at on that given day. It doesn't necessarily need to be the same thing. How important for you in the warm up side of things of like physical, what does it look like on a day? Like, do you ever feel rushed? How do you kind of slow down yourself? Is that all through music or do you have other things that you do when you've got like a, let's say you've got like a shorter time period than you're necessarily used to. Like what would be the steps that you take when you go into that situation? Yeah. So I've actually had the opportunity to practice that a lot in college. Some college matches, college matches are just a lot different than international ones because we're shooting like two to three events in one day and internationally and nationally, we're only shooting one event in one day. And so I've really had to play around with going into college matches and kind of messing, not messing with my warm routine, um, trying new warm up routines, I guess. And so freshman year, it was a crazy culture shock to me that I would get to the range and have like 20 minutes to warm up for a match when usually I'd have an hour. And so I really played around with that my freshman, probably sophomore year too, and just became comfortable with being uncomfortable. That was a big thing for me coming into college was just having an open mind and just learning how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so I would play around with, okay, if I have 20 minutes, I need to focus on these certain skills. Let me focus on like really good stretching and then go for some like longer holds, longer holds that I'm used to just to get like the muscles activated. Or I'll focus just on looking at the front sight for this one skill. So the skills in shooting are like very, like we say them and they sound very generic. But to us, it's like a whole, it's a whole nother meaning. So I'm like, look at the front side. It's like, we're not just looking at it. We're like focusing on it and like keeping the focus through. And so we go through the skills and warm up so we can put them all together in a match. And so if I have a short warm up, I'll instead of doing maybe five sets or like five reps of this one skill, I'll do two or three and then move on and stuff like that. So I'm able to kind of change it to when I need to. I actually was dealing with a wrist injury this past year since February, actually. Uh, I re-injured my wrist. I injured it like a year before. So I re-injured that. And so I really had to adjust my warm-up routine and make it lighter so I wasn't too exhausted by the time the match came. And so that really has helped me. Like not being able to pick up your gun because you're in pain has really helped me figure out like, okay, I don't need that much warm-up. Or if I know if I'm running late to a match or if like something happens, I know I'm prepared for it. I like it. It's like you take the moment of here's the necessities. This is what I need to do in the shortened warm up, and everything else can become an added bonus. But like, here's the standard of what I have to do every time. This is what I need. And then anything else that I get, like if I go to international competition and I get an hour and a half instead of an hour, or I get to a match a little bit earlier than I was anticipating, like, okay, I'll get to do a couple extra reps, but here's my baseline. Here's what I absolutely need. And I like that college gave that to you. I think that it is funny. You hear a lot from a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different sports is there's such a different element to a college game day versus an international or professional level, whatever game day it looks like beyond college. And 
I relate to it a lot too. We we have an entirely different format from college beach to professional beach is it's literally just individual competitions when you're going into the professional scene. But in college, it's five pairs versus another university's five pairs. And so you go from having this like huge team warm up where you have 12 people who are all doing the same thing and working with each other to you go you go out to a domestic tour, or even an international tour event. And it's like just you and your partner, sometimes a coach, if you can afford it. But like you were saying, it's like there's a whole different element to like what a warm up looks like, what it looks like when you're going in to a college versus an international game day versus like where's the heightened pressure and elsewhere. And I like that you've kind of got the steps for each of them. Yeah, definitely played around with it for a couple of years, but college has helped me become more adaptable for sure. And I'm super grateful for all the experiences, good or bad. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, there's there's the highs and lows of all of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of gratitude that comes from it as well, because it goes back to you said pressure is a privilege without saying pressure is a privilege there. You were like, you know, like finding comfort in the discomfort. And I'm like, huh, mm -hmm. this goes back to like your core statement of really finding opportunities to grow from opportunities that might make somebody else shrink. It's like, what can I do to improve myself from here when this situation makes me so uncomfortable? How do I get there from there? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. I've learned that a lot in college. I think just taking a challenge, being like, okay, I can't control anything that's going on around me, but I can control how I react to it. So it's like, what can I do now about it? I love it. It's exactly that. It's like, how can I make the best out of the exact situation that I'm handed in this moment? And then how do I get, how do I adjust to a situation that's completely different when I go in and out? Exactly. For you, I'm, I would love to kind of find out a little bit more about the international versus collegiate competition schedule. How does it work for you when you're kind of coming in and out of college and international competitions? How much does the mindset shift when you're going in? Are you competing in both at the same time? What does that look like and feel like for you as you kind of have such a different, like you were saying, 20 minute warm up versus an hour warm up? What's it, what's it like and do you have to do them at the same time is the next question. <laughs> Yeah, so the college season for Ohio State, at least, it starts usually early October and goes until March with a break in December. So December, there's no college matches. International matches kind of go from I, – I, there's, like, no season, really. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think back of, like, last year. I think we had competitions from, like, January to – December, I don't think I've gone internationally before, but we have domestic competitions that are like pretty similar during then. So there's really no break besides Christmas. But even then, we had part three of our Olympic trials like two days after New Year's last or this year, actually. So there's really no break with international or national competitions. So yeah, I would, I remember, what was it, 2022, I think, I went from Championship of the Americas in Lima, Peru. I flew from there straight to Utah for a college competition with actually one of my coaches and a teammate. And so we like got off the plane from Peru like Friday at noon and then we shot a match at 6 p.m. that night at Utah. <laughs> and I actually have the personal best I remember because I was oh just my gosh. So, I was so tired, so exhausted. Yeah, we were we were like, okay, challenge. Like, what happens if our flight gets delayed? Like, this was before I made um, the Olympic team, but everything was about Paris, right? We're like, okay, what if this happens in Paris? What if we get to Paris, flights delayed, whatever, and we get there and we have to shoot a match? Like, how are we going to deal with that? Let's try it here and see what happens. So, yeah, it's funny because those are the memories I, I love and I, like, hold on to them so much because it was just – so crazy to think that I got off a plane at like noon and shot a match like six hours later. I think I had like a 30 minute nap. Um, but yeah, so college and national and national matches, they all happen at the same time. Um, I'd missed a couple college matches for national matches. Yeah, because in college matches, there's, I think we have, we had 12 as, for a season uh, spanning from October to March. And so there were more like little check-ins like, okay, we are not trying to shoot the highest scores. We're not we're not trying to peak right now. We're just seeing what works and what doesn't. And so if something didn't work in a college match, I knew I was like, okay, cool. I have a couple weeks until the next world cup where I can fix this. And so those are really good as like just little reminders, like, okay, this doesn't work. We need to work on this a little more. This works really great. We're going to keep doing this stuff like that. Oh, that's cool. It's a reframe. And it, go, mm -hmm. it kind of connects back to what you were talking about of the whole idea of like shifting something in a more positive direction. And 
there is the natural negativity bias that every human has, which is so difficult because it's like looking into any given moment, like our minds will naturally shift to what's the worst thing that could happen or what's the negative thing that could happen. And so really putting in that effort to be like, okay, how do I reframe this? How do I really make it positive? It goes back to what you were talking fundamentally for you of like, how do I find the positive in this situation? And I loved hearing that come out right there of you're like, okay, I'm not trying to shoot my best in this moment. I want to peak when I go to Paris or I want to peak at the national championship. I want to do X, Y, Z. Okay. This happened at this event. Now I'm going to go and hone this in. I also love that you shot a personal best when you were absolutely exhausted coming off of flying. Absolutely phenomenal. And again, you're (laughs) looking at the mindset shift of like, not just I'm exhausted. I'm going to go shoot a match and see how well I can do. It's like, okay, I'm preparing myself for the what could happen when I'm going into this, the height of my career potentially of an Olympic competition. Like what happens if everything hits the fan? Like what do I do in that case scenario? And you gave yourself the opportunity to really develop and to really figure out, okay, what happens when I'm just at my wit's end? Like this is what happens when I'm at my wit's end. (laughs) It's pretty special. (laughs) It really is. Yeah. And I'm also like, I talk about positivity a lot, but everyone has those negative thoughts. Everybody, I struggle with it a lot too. I think it's just being able to be aware of it. And like you said, shift that focus and figure out like what you need to focus on right now to shift that focus. When you were talking about journaling, how important has, or how much of a factor has journaling for you? Cause you talked about how it's really important for you to be able to have that. How good has that been for the reframe and working into the positive side of things and really trying to shift that mindset? How much has journaling factored into kind of helping with the bias that we all naturally have? I think it's amazing. It's crazy what just putting a couple positive thoughts on a piece of paper will do for you. And even the negative ones, just putting what you feel on paper and being like, okay, this is really negative. Do I need to be thinking about this right now? No. Can I control this? No. So why am I worrying about this? Like why? Like I still do this all the time. Like I'm not perfect whatsoever. I still have those thoughts of, oh my gosh, like why is this not working or why can't I control this? But it's just trying to just trying your best to be aware of it and just working on it every day. And I think like gratitude journaling is a great thing. Just jotting down a couple of things you're grateful for and being like, yeah, you're right. Like it's not that bad out right now. Like I'm, I have some things I'm really grateful for and I need to remember those and not these negative things I keep thinking of. It goes into that whole idea and you know the practice with Strong Girls United of the three good things practice. We've we've done it a lot and we've we've practiced and we've preached it a lot of the whole element of combating the negativity bias of finding three good things in your everyday, of finding three good things of no matter how high or how low your day has been, you can usually find three good things in each moment of like, okay, I may be super under the weather and just having myself a day, but my coffee tasted so good this morning. Like there's something that you might forget about in the moment, but then you go back and you reflect and it's like, oh, this day really wasn't as bad as it was. Or that moment, these nerves aren't as bad. And just being able to externalize, I love that you're like write out the negative stuff too, because again, it's that whole element of like externalize those feelings. So then you're able to process them better. I'm a big like external processor. Anytime that I have kind of a discomfort or negative thought, I really like to just put it out in the open. It's like, okay, this is what's going on in my head. We're just going to pop that out there. This is what I'm going through. And then I'm going to work through it afterwards. Uh, But I have to externalize so that then I can work on the internal side of things and really kind of reframe and go from there. But if I don't externalize, then the internal stuff just starts to kind of not feel the greatest. Yeah. I really like that. How you're like, yeah, I'm feeling this and that's okay. And we're going to work on that. Like just putting it out there and be like, yep, I'm not ignoring it. I'm not hiding it. I'm going to accept it and move on. Like, I really love that. Exactly. I've been, I've been working on doing it more on game days as well. And I'm sure that you can say this as like you journal and you really work on kind of honing in on the focus side of your like practice day. My partner and I have been doing a much better job of like sharing when we have nervous moments. Like we go, you go and fly across the world to a tournament and you're in Europe and you're about to go out and play a team that you've never seen before when you're so used to playing like a domestic event or a college event, when you know your opponent and you've got a better scout, when you have no idea who you're playing and you're like in a country and you're playing their home team and everybody is rooting against you. It's like, look at my partner. And I'm like, 
I'm not going to lie to you right now. My nerves are a little bit high. I'm going to work through those, but I just want you to know this so that then we can go from there. And I know that with pistol, it's a really individual sport, but I liked how you talked about the gratitude journaling or honing in with your music of like really taking, Hey, I'm in this big box and this big situation. And how do I find something that brings the control back to me? Definitely. Yeah. And even though it's a super individual sport, I think my coaches are amazing and I go to them for almost everything. I know like before a match, if I'm, especially during Olympic trials in the Olympics, I go to them before and be like, I'm kind of freaking out right now. I remember, so both of, both my coaches were in Paris. So I had them there. And I remember before the first match, I went to my coach and I was like, I'm kind of freaking out right now. I was like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, what, what, what is this? It's like, I see Linda oh. Green. I was like, I was like, I'm kind of freaking out. And so, but like, I talked through it with him and we were like, okay, you're right. Like, it's not that deep. Like, I don't know why I'm freaking out. It's just another match. And I've definitely been in those matches where I didn't vocalize those feelings. I just kept telling myself I was okay. I was like, it's fine. Everything's fine. Like, I'm good. And I would get to the line or get halfway through the match and be like, I'm actually not fine. And it's too late now because I just shot half a match not being okay and freaking out in because I wouldn't accept that I was freaking out. I was trying to be tough and strong. But in reality, I think being able to be aware of your, your fears or your like scary thoughts, I think that's even stronger than just ignoring everything. Just being able to accept like, it's, I'm not okay right now. And, but I'm working through it and we're going to get okay. But right now I'm not good. So I like it. Sometimes vulnerability is the greatest strength. Definitely. I love it. I I love you're like, okay, yeah, this, this is just, it's just one big competition, but there's some fancy things on the wall, like some circles (laughs) over there, but those are, those are circles to acknowledge later. Right now I've just got to enter this match and really, really hone in, but it is, it's like you stepped into the highest, again, going back to the whole pressure situation, the highest pressure situation that you possibly could have entered yourself in. And then had to figure out like, okay, this is a lot. How do I then go from there? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Looking into your Olympic journey, I didn't even know that you were an alternate for Tokyo, which is so, I mean, I know it was probably really frustrating in the moment, but you were 19 years old and that's really, really phenomenal that you were able to get as far, like to get to that level at 19 is absolutely insanely incredible. So acknowledging that, but then looking at your two Olympic journeys that you've been on at this point, can you talk through just kind of the, what you were feeling in each of those moments? And then can you elaborate on the emotions and like talk about just being named to that Olympic roster, finding out that you'd made the team in 2024? How special was that? Oh my gosh. Oh, so special. (laughs) I still can't put into words that feeling that day I made the, made the team. Um, I actually was battling a really bad cold that day. And so I woke up, like, I remember I took NyQuil the night before because I was just not okay. So I woke up super groggy, super just not in the right mindset. I remember I put my leggings on backwards and I didn't realize till I was warming up for the competition. <laughs> <laughs> was like stretching and I was like why are my pockets on like weird ways I look like I was like oh my goodness I was like I actually put these on backwards <laughs> like that's how out of it I was the day I made the air pistol team in January so like my first ever Olympic team so I was really just trying to survive during that competition just trying to get done with it which I definitely not the right mindset at all but I was just I had a fever and I'm pretty sure I had a fever like the first 20 shots. It's, I was I was freezing and I was hot and it was, yeah. So it was, I really just had to trust my process completely, which is what you try to do every single competition. But at that moment, I, it was just like a hundred percent trust because I was just feeling so bad. And I was like, I know I can't make it any better than it is. Like I it really had to go back to just accepting what I was given, just accepting the challenge and being like, okay, like we're going to fight for this today. Cause it's the last day of trials. It's like, this is the sixth match I've shot of air pistol. I was like, I'm not letting this go this easy. Like I'm going to put hundred percent of what I have left. If I'm on the floor after, I don't care. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to put it all that I have into it. And it worked out obviously. And I remember after shooting the final, so it was like a match in the final 
and I got out pretty, so it's elimination style final. You get points based on how, how long you stay in. I got out pretty early on. So I was like, yeah, there's no way I made, I no way I made it. And my coaches didn't know either. Like I sat down next to my coach and he was like, yeah, he's like, I really don't know. I was like, you could have to go. You, it might be, t- it's probably tied. He's like, so you might have to do a shoot off, which is essentially like you shoot one shot. Whoever wins gets the spot. Which luckily there was no shoot off because that wasn't in the selection procedures. Uh, they changed it that time and we didn't really know. And so I was tied with the other girl and it was based on center shots. So a 10.4 or higher is called an X and those are used as tiebreakers. So I had more X's than her, which is why I made the team in air pistol. And so like after here, so there was a lot of like waiting, a lot of like, oh, did who made it, who didn't, like stuff like that. So it was just, I was kind of just accepted that I didn't make it. And I was like, oh, it's okay. Like there's still 25 meters in March. Like I, that's my event too. 22 was like my event. And so I was like, okay, it's okay. We'll, we have a couple more months. It'll be okay. And then my coach told me I made it. And I was like, you're, you're joking. I was like, you're actually joking right now. And I just could not believe it was real. Like, <laughs> I don't think it hit me a lot until probably like three weeks later when I had like my first interview with like a local news station and and they're like, Oh, like, what are you most excited for about Paris? And I'm like, wait, I'm going to Paris. What? I was like, Oh yeah, (laughs) crazy. (laughs) Um, So it was just a surreal feeling that all the hard work finally came together and that this goal was finally achieved. And, you know, it's, been the thing on my mind since I didn't make Tokyo. So for it to finally happen was just a crazy feeling. And yeah, it didn't really feel real for the longest time. Like it didn't feel 100% real until I was in Paris for sure. And I saw, I think, what was it? Yeah, I walked through like the Team USA processing warehouse and I was like, oh, I'm an Olympian. This is cool. (laughs) So yeah, definitely a mix of emotions, completely different than after Tokyo because it was very disappointing, very... I was very down on myself after Tokyo for sure, after the trials, but I used that to fuel me for the next four years. And I changed my mindset after that and kind of just tried to have fun with it a lot more than I did going into Tokyo. Just really try to enjoy the journey. And even though I wanted the the trial process to be over because I was, I mean, everyone that goes through Olympic trials knows how stressful it is and how just the vibe of everything is different. You walk into the competition and people are just, there's tension in the air. You can feel it. And so I just wanted it to be over, but I really worked with my coaches and my sports psychologists being like, okay, just enjoy it. Like you've been waiting for this the past three and a half years and you're finally here. So just take the time, enjoy it. Like just have fun, run your process, see what happens. And I mean, an Olympics happened, so it worked. (laughs) It's pretty cool. It's I I'm like it brought a little tear to my eye as you were talking about just being named to that roster and the stress of like waiting to find out. I could not imagine having to go to like a one shot is like the last is it just determines everything of whether or not you're on this journey or off this journey now. Glad that you didn't have to. Yeah, I'm so happy that it didn't have to come to that. (laughs) But it's really special just having that moment and. Like you said, like you were so down on yourself coming out of just being the alternate and then knowing that you'd earned that spot in in the Paris games and then being able to go and do what you did. I love walking through processing. It's like you see your name on the mirror that pops up at Nike and you're like, whoa, that's me. I see that now. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. That was, wait. That was a real pinch me moment for sure. So cool. It's, I, I mean, it's again, it's only a handful of people in their entire lives get to do it and you get to say you were one of them. Yeah. Looking at the emotions leading up to the games, you obviously you had mentioned your event, your event is 25 meter and you then qualified for the Olympics in 25 meter as well. So pretty special after you got the 10 meter air pistol. So being able to compete in two events and then knowing that you had the buildup from January, then March, all the way to July when the Olympics started and when you were in the facility and doing everything, what were the emotions like leading up to the Olympics and now kind of following? What are your emotions like now that you can say you are an Olympian and have (laughs) competed and made it as far as you have? They're a roller coaster for sure. I think the major emotion I'm having is just gratitude for everyone who's been on this journey with me. It's been 
a crazy ride. And I've had so many amazing people support me from my parents, my family, my close friends, my coaches, Ohio State Athletics, like their USA shooting. There's just been so many amazing people who have helped me get here. And I think that's the biggest emotion I felt even like leading up to the games was just like, wow, like so many people have helped me get here and there's no way I could have done this on my own. And then having that support system in Paris. So both my parents were able to go to Paris and watch me, both my coaches. And so having like that core four group there was just an amazing feeling. It made the difference for sure. Just knowing I had my little, like my little fan club (laughs) behind me. (laughs) But yeah, the emotions are just crazy. Going into Paris, there was definitely a lot of a lot of unknown because I didn't really know how to prepare for an Olympic Games. I obviously had a lot of help from other people, but I personally never experienced that. So that was a major thing I was going through was I just didn't know what to expect. And when I got there, I was very like I was very unaware of myself, my feelings for like the first week. I was kind of in a haze, I like to call it. I just felt very off. And this, I didn't, didn't really hit me until like the day before competition was just like, oh, something's not right here. I was like, I don't really know what it is. And I think it was just me just being in a different environment, just being unknown, like just not knowing what to expect and just like finally reaching that goal kind of left me, I don't want to say at my lowest, but at a very low point that I wasn't familiar with. And so I had to work through that a lot during the games with my great coaches. A lot of tough conversations were had. A lot of tears were shed. I'm not going to lie, but they were good tears, productive tears. And yeah, it just goes to show that even when everything looks great outside, like when someone's at their literal dream, the thing they've worked through, worked for for years, that things can still be not okay inside. And I think I was battling that a lot it was like I should be super happy to be here like why am I feeling this weird like this weird low point like why am I feeling off like I should be I'm prepared I've put in all this work and I should be super happy right now and I was happy obviously but I would there was still those points of like what am I doing here like what like that imposter syndrome kind of the whole like I've put so much work into this what 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 happens if it goes wrong and so there was definitely a lot of emotions to work work through in Paris, before Paris, after Paris. So yeah, a lot of different emotions for sure. I really liked what you said there of like, from the outside, it could be looking super rosy, but then on the inside, you could be feeling at your worst. And I feel like that internal battle of like, why am I feeling this way? I should be so happy. It's so hard in sport because really... There's sometimes there's just that unexplained, like it could be nerves. It could be some sort of external pressure. You could just be under the weather. And from the outside in sport, it's like, oh my gosh, you should just be having this abundance of gratitude from the beginning. But looking at the hyperized pressure and achieving this peak that you've been really working for, like that's a really tough thing. Like of, oh my gosh, I'm here. What Then the what ifs start in your head. And for you to be able to really take back and like have your support system there and be able to work with your sports psych and to talk with your coaches and have those moments. It's, it's cool that you gave yourself the ability to acknowledge that. And it's really special that you were able to work through that all while competing and then, you know, really succeeding as you were competing as well. It's, it's a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. My success there at the games wouldn't have been possible if I didn't have those hard conversations the night before competitions. <laughs> and it, yeah, cause it took me a while to acknowledge it in something that's not really common for me. I'm usually pretty aware of that stuff. And so the fact that it took me that long to acknowledge it and had a coach tell me like, Hey, you're off. Like we got to figure this out. And so it was hard, but needed for sure. And yeah. Hard, but needed. It's it, it, Definitely. it really is needed yeah. to be able to be done. And I like that you were able to do it, like, regardless of the timeline. Uh, The fact that you were able to do it at all is pretty special. And, I mean, again, we can go back to the amount of pressure that being at the Olympic Games and being present, we could could sing that till the cows come home. But at the end of the day, the fact that you were able to then process it and probably not process it all immediately in that first night of that conversation, 
but be able to acknowledge that that was what was going on as you entered competition. It goes back to what we were talking about of like finding ways to externalize so that you know exactly what you're able to give and what you need to give in that moment. But if you just, if you lock that in and don't share that with the people around you and don't look to get that support, it's not ever really particularly going to end up that great. Like, yeah, like performance goes down the more that you internalize and that you let yourself kind of, I don't even know what word to say about this, but like the more that you let it, I don't know, just wallow and kind of fester, fester. Mm -hmm. That was the word I was looking for. (laughs) But the more that you let it fester, it's like the worst you're going to get on the result. And so I, I'm so happy that you actually had the opportunity to really talk about what was going on for you before you entered competition and still keep having those conversations all while doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) Now, we've talked a lot about looking back. For you now, looking in the present moment and looking forward, what is success looking like for you now moving forward? Goals for your next chapters? What's what's your next chapter? Do you have any plans now that we're a little over a month and a half post games? Yeah, so right now I'm working on getting my master's degree in public health. So I'm in my last year of that program. So my prime focus right now is classes. I'm a graduate research assistant. I'm working on a, I call it like a mini thesis. It's like what I have to do to graduate. So right now it's a lot of school, a lot of unknowns for (laughs) sure, trying to figure out what is a post-grad school. And yeah, I think success for me right now is giving a hundred percent to everything I have on my plate, no matter how I feel or what's going on, just give it all that I have and try to find myself out of sport, I guess. And yeah, like I've been shooting nonstop for probably 10 years with maybe a three week break or two. And right now I'm on an undetermined break. So I think just trying to find myself and figure out who I am as a post Olympian, I think is the major thing that I'm trying to do. And so right now it's working. I'm Still, I'm still working out like crazy. I think I'm working out more than when I did before the Olympics, (laughs) coping in my own way. (laughs) But yeah, and just studying and working on my career. So success is definitely looking different now, but still the same basics. Yeah. I love it. Be real. How many goosebumps did you get when you said (laughs) post-Olympian there? Because I got goosebumps when you said that. I was like, ooh, that's a cool thing to say. (laughs) Every time I refer to myself as an Olympian or like here, I'm like, whoa, wait, who, who are you talking about? Wait a minute. So yeah, like, and the fact that we're after, yeah, post, yeah. yeah it's it's still- like the dart, the eye dart back and forth. It's like, wait, oh wait, <laughs> wait that's me? Yeah. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. I, I love like hearing your story and I think it's cool like seeing the fact that you've got this next chapter of like. TBD on what the future holds. You've got, like we talked about, you're a youngin. Like you've got a lot of time to really figure out what these next steps are because you were an Olympian at 23 years old, which is so, so phenomenal. And TBD on what's next, but I love that success is like finding little things and like kind of growing at a time. I think what you're doing for your master's program is so freaking cool. So that's also pretty amazing. And I'm just excited to keep on watching you grow and rooting you on all the way. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Now, Caitlin, to close us out here, we've got a fun little bit for our ending here of Strong Girls Pod. And these are our Strong Girls United series questions. And you've been with Strong Girls United for quite a bit. So you know the pillars of our nonprofit. For our returning listeners, you know the pillars of Strong Girls pretty well. But for our new listeners tuning in for the first time, the pillars of Strong Girls United are strong bodies, kind hearts, and unstoppable minds. And we use these three pillars to kind of inspire everything that we do. We really, really find that those foundational three can contribute to Strong Girls all the way around and turn Strong Girls into strong women in the long run. So in the spirit of the pillars of our nonprofit. We've got three questions for you here. So starting us off, Caitlin, how do you keep your body strong? I would say by consistent movement, whether it be a intense workout or just a half mile walk, just consistent movement, trying to move your body. 
And I think forgiveness is a big thing for me, just forgiving yourself, even if forgiving your body, if you don't feel like working out, if you don't feel like moving, that it's okay to have an off day. It's okay to be tired or sick or it's just forgive your body because it does so much for you on a day-to-day basis. Ooh, I like that. That was <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, next up, how do you keep your heart kind? I'd say looking for positives in any situation. I know we talked about it a lot in this podcast, but like practicing gratitude and I pray a lot. So I think just being grateful and thanking people for like what they do for you. Oh, now last up, how do you keep your mind unstoppable? I would say by having a growth mindset. I think that is the secret weapon that a lot of people either don't know about or do, and they just kind of forget about it. I learned about a growth mindset probably like three years, four years ago, right before I actually started with Strong Girls United. And just taking every challenge as a learning opportunity is this insane skill to have. And even if you don't do it every time, just knowing about a growth mindset and being aware of it and trying to get better by 1% every single day, I think is an amazing tool. And I think that's how I keep my mind unstoppable. I love it. That was, I mean, hit the nail on the head there. Like the growth mindset is literally, it's like, how do you continue to grow? Like find ways, find little things that can keep on elevating and going from there and keep you unstoppable. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I love it. Well, Caitlin, I really, really can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been so much fun, like just hearing your journey and hearing, opening the file and hearing how it all started. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was great to share it all. Of course. Well, for all our listeners who have been tuning in, thank you so much for joining us today for another episode of Strong Girls Pod. As always, I'm your host, Charlie Ekstrom, and I'm here with Caitlin Ablin, and we are signing off. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on Strong Girls Pod. In the spirit of growing community and inspiring strong girls and women everywhere, please subscribe rate, and leave a comment about our podcast. Tell your friends, family, really everyone to listen in and enjoy. This podcast is sponsored by Strong Girls United, a nonprofit with a mission to empower girls to be strong, confident, and resilient through sports mentorship and mental health programming. Visit sgunitedfoundation.org to learn more on how you can get involved today.